This is Macro Voices with hedge fund manager Eric Townsend, the free weekly financial podcast targeting professional finance, high net worth individuals, family offices, and other sophisticated investors. Macro Voices is all about the brightest minds in the world of finance and macroeconomics telling it like it is, bullish or bearish, no holds barred. Now, here are your hosts, Eric Townsend and Patrick Ceresna. Macro Voices episode 187 was recorded on October 3rd, 2019. I'm Eric Townsend. One River Asset Management Chief Investment Officer Eric Peters will join me as this week's feature interview guest. Eric says the era of monetary policy dominance over financial markets is coming to an end and that fiscal policy will soon become the primary driving force. We'll discuss that as well as Eric's outlook for equities, fixed income, and precious metals. And be sure to stay tuned for our post-game segment after the feature interview when Patrick will have yet another of his famous chart books for for extended equity and gold market coverage. And I'm Patrick Ceresna. Now, Eric, the S&P 500 uh, certainly has returned to some volatility. After a couple of weeks of a very tight, almost 40 S&P point range, we finally got a, a pretty significant downdraft with some uh, weak economic numbers. What's your take on the market here? Well, Patrick, the ISM print was the primary proximal catalyst for the selling, but I think the big picture is much more complex. Today was a textbook reversal candle on the S&P. You, you saw that really big panic selling that happened right on the ISM print and then the reversal back to the upside, closing the day higher. But Patrick, I don't mind admitting that I am completely without directional conviction on equities here. And the reason is, frankly, if we are a about to have another 2008 style crisis, this is exactly how it would start. We're at the right time of year. Uh, and as far as I'm concerned, it's long overdue for reality to catch up with the stock market. But this could also be the market's way of kicking the Fed in the tail to get them to take more aggressive action. And if we get a QE4 announcement, as Juliet de Klerk has predicted that we will in Q4, of course, it's not till Halloween that we have our next FOMC meeting coming up, you know, that could be a sudden trend reversal and all of a sudden we're racing to new all-time highs. Doesn't make sense to me, but history has shown us that when they announce more quantitative easing, the market just can't get enough of it and stocks just go ripping higher. So I, I think there's plenty of good reasons to think that we're in really big trouble here. And there's plenty of good reasons to think that we're about to have another monetary policy saving the day moment. Now, bigger picture wise, I don't think that's sustainable. I think the era of monetary policy saving the day is not going to last much longer. And I'm really looking forward to talking to Eric Peters about that because he's been writing quite a bit about that very subject. So we'll save that for the feature interview. But so far, I don't want to be long and I don't dare to be short, at least not yet. Okay, well, you said not yet. So what would make you change your mind and have some sort of a short conviction then? Oh, what would give me huge conviction that would cause me to pile into a short on the S&P, you know, backing up the leverage truck would be if we got the announcement of QE4, that the Fed is going to go back to quantitative easing in earnest. And that causes a little pop up and it doesn't last. And the market continues to sell off anyway. And we get a closing print below where the QE4 news came out. That would be the signal that says, OK, the air era of monetary policy propping up financial markets has finally ended about five or six years overdue as far as I'm concerned. But until I see that signal, I, I have to assume that as things get bad in the market, the Fed will come riding into the rescue. And at least what we've seen in the past is that monetary policy impetus, that monetary policy charade, if you will, it's worked in the past. I didn't think it should, but I don't want to get caught short, Patrick, and have the S&P suddenly rip higher on the announcement of QE4. And I agree with Juliet. I think it's probably coming. Right. You know, I mean, the the one thing I can tell you about shorting markets is that uh, they're incredibly volatile and the snapbacks uh, can uh, can be huge. And so anyone that's too leveraged can easily get shaken out of their shorts. Anyway, let's move on to the U.S. dollar, because after those negative ISM prints, or at least uh, much lower than expected ISM prints, the um, U.S. dollar has been backing off of its high. You think that's it for the dollar? Could that have been the top then? <laughs> 
you know, all the dollar bears are screaming at the top of their lungs. That's it. The, the top is in. They, they said that the last four or five times the dollar has done what it did this week, which is to hit the top of its long running price channel. And of course, you know, Patrick, you're a technician. When you hit the channel resistance line, you tend to sell off until you hit the channel support line and then you rally some more. We come off of the channel resistance line. We're still above the channel support line. There's no reason to interpret this as anything other than a normal correction in a healthy uptrend. Now, of course, that could change, but so far, everything that we're seeing is healthy uptrend conditions as far as I'm concerned. What I am getting a little more concerned about, though, is that as the dollar continues to appreciate, which I think it will, the policy responses are going to get bigger and stronger. The strengthening dollar is going to cause a lot of problems for the economy around the world, and I expect that there will be policy responses that will eventually reverse it. But what's going to be really interesting is if we do get QE4, is does it actually reverse this dollar rally, or does it just give it a, a really good kick in the teeth correction that it ends up eventually climbing out of? It's going to be really interesting to see that. But for now, until we get some kind of dramatic policy action, I think the dollar keeps grinding higher. Eric, let's move on to oil. It's actually quite surprising to me to see a $12 sell-off from its gap highs there. What's going on here, and how did the inventories come in? Well, I'm surprised to hear you say that. I think that it was actually pretty easy to see the sell-off coming to this level that we're at now. I actually thought we'd get a retest of 50. 50 spot 66 is the number I'm watching for. We got within 35 cents of that this morning. So not quite there yet, but you know maybe that's uh, as close as we're going to get. We'll see what happens. Let's start with inventory, though. Crude oil building 3.1 million barrels. Now, that was on the back of API, the private data service, reporting a five point something or rather million barrel drawdown opposite direction. That caused the market to move higher on Tuesday afternoon. And of course, on Wednesday, when the official data came out as a build that, and actually it was, it was interesting. The, the market had really started selling off pretty briskly before the data even came out. I don't know if that meant that some people got the number earlier or they, they just had anticipated that uh, API had the number wrong. But in any case, the market was already selling off aggressively on Wednesday morning, and that confirmation with the EIA number being a large build on inventory just accelerated the pace of selling. Cushing, Oklahoma, drawing down 201,000 barrels. Now, remember, I'm watching Cushing very closely because with new pipelines online taking a lot of landlocked oil away from Cushing, I think that's going to change the dynamics and change the amount of storage that we have in Cushing, and it looks like that trend is continuing. It's a small drawdown, but still, it's a drawdown even in the face of a national build. And I think that's a reflection of those pipelines that are now back online after being taken offline by the storm in Texas that are moving oil out of Cushing down to the Gulf Coast. Gasoline drawing down 228,000 barrels, so a drawdown, but a small drawdown. Distillates, still a significant drawdown, 2.4 million barrels. The tape action was down and accelerating faster down in reaction to inventory. U.S. production off to 12.4 million barrels. That's just 100,000 barrels off of the all-time record high just set a week or two ago. Imports 6.3 million barrels, exports 2.9 million barrels. So this move down, as far as I'm concerned, was pretty easy to see coming. We've seen this support level at about 50 spot 66. It's been tested three times now since May, and so far we've always got pretty resilient bounces off of it. I think that with the deteriorating growth conditions around the world, fear of recession, plunging bond yields, these are all signals that contribute to oil selling off to this level. But the thing is, that 50 spot 66 level has been what's held and caused pretty significant bounce backs the last three times it was tested. So will we get a closing print below that? And if we do, the next numbers to watch, as, as I say, 50, 66 is that recent low. If I look at the market profile chart, though, the low volume nodes are all centered around 49 spot 97. So just a hair under $50, maybe uh Tempting traders by, by getting that round number test before moving back higher might be in the cards. If that doesn't hold, though, if we saw a daily close below 49.97, the next target down really is 46 spot 61. That's a wedge support line. If you 
draw a line from the 2016 lows through the Christmas lows of last year. That line uh, ends up at about 46 spot 61. If that didn't hold, then 42 spot 40, which is the level from Christmas, would be the next support. And if that didn't hold, it would be all the way down to 26. Now, the reason I mention all of these way low numbers, I don't necessarily think they're coming. I think if we were to see a really dramatic acceleration of the selling in the S&P, that might be the catalyst to cause a break below $50. But if we don't get some kind of uh, panic in markets generally, I think that we're going to bounce off of either 50 spot 66 or 49 spot 97, and the next wave will be you know, uh, back up to 55 or so. We'll see what happens. All right. Well, let's move on to gold because, uh, well, we'll talk more about gold in the post game. But what's your thinking here? Was that a short term low? Well, Patrick, we are at an all time record speculative long position, according to the commitment of traders reports. And that is a sentiment indication, which is extremely bearish. What it means is everybody is all in on the speculative long gold trade to a greater extent than they've ever been before. Now, I think they're right to be all in on it. I think that the fundamentals for gold are incredibly strong long term. But as Jim Rogers used to say, when everybody is on the same side of the boat, even if they're right to be on that side of the boat, a few of them are going to get knocked overboard as you come into some turbulence in the waves. And I think that what we're headed for here is with this extreme speculative long position, we're going to get a shakeout, some kind of a pullback, probably back down to that 1360 to 1377 breakout level. And I certainly will be buying there. I'll start buying before that. But I do think we're going to see 1400 before we see 1600. Time will tell, but uh, that's my leaning at this point. All right. Well, let's move on to the 10 year treasury yields because, well, we're heading right back to, to one spot five zero. We're not there yet, but uh, it certainly feels like that. What's, uh, what's your thinking here on yields? Well, I think that this panic in the S&P has been driving a lot of it. I'm very happy to be long 10-year futures. The uh, pullback in the dollar index, needless to say, hurt my long position of the dollar, but it was perfectly made up for. I, I didn't lose any money in terms of account equity because we've had a huge move down in yields in the last few days as the dollar has come off of its highs. So uh, that pairs trade is actually working extremely well, and I think that long dollar, long bond, and long gold are all going to be excellent trades in coming months and years. As far as where it goes from here, I think it really depends on whether we're headed. I mean, let's let's say there's three scenarios. One is it looked like a reversal candle today. Maybe the short-term panic is over uh, over this ISM thing, and, and maybe the market's going to head higher. Maybe not. Maybe we're in that scenario that a lot of people are writing and talking about, which is a repeat of last year, where Q4 looks like Q4 of last year. We get a really big sell-off. It bottoms around Christmas time and then rebounds. If that were to happen, then I think that you're definitely going to see lower bond yields probably taking out that one spot 35 low. And of course, if you were to go the, the extreme case, which is it's more than just those things, let's say you got quantitative easing announced and it wasn't enough and it didn't save the market and it kept selling off and suddenly you're below 2000 on the S&P and you're actually having a market crash, well, then I think we're headed to 1% on the 10-year. But for now, uh, it really depends on what the market does next, I think. Well, thanks for the update, Eric. This week's featured interview features One River CIO, Eric Peters. Now, Eric, why did we invite Eric back onto the show this week? Well, Eric Peters is a really interesting guy. He's a big picture thinker who thinks about the long term. And, you know, I, I've been, I'm sure many of our listeners have noticed, Patrick, I've been trying to coax a few of our guests to talk about, hey, we've got a completely different social mood that is in the making, where younger generations favor socialism over capitalism, where a lot of people are calling for wealth redistribution, and where we've got modern monetary policy potentially providing the ammunition that politicians will use, even though MMT, designers of MMT, certainly understand and fear inflation. My prediction is the politicians are going to use MMT as justification for reckless printing of money and spending. So there's a lot of 
big picture things that are in a state of change right now. And not that many people are talking about them. Eric Peters is the kind of guy who's always thinking several steps ahead about the big picture. And he's been writing quite a bit. If you look in your research roundup email, you'll find some of Eric's weekend notes on these topics, talking about how the coming wealth redistribution is going to change asset markets. So he's a really smart guy and a big picture guy. Now, Patrick, this is the point where I normally read our sponsor announcement, but since we don't have a sponsor announcement this week, I'm going to use that time to give our listeners a quick update on where we stand with sponsorship because, frankly, we really need your help. We had a wonderful experience with Niels Kastrup Larsen and Top Traders Unplugged. They had only planned a one-quarter advertising campaign in Q3, which is now over. They are going to come back in Q4. They're extending their plans. It won't be every episode. But I think it's really interesting that the, the one guy who seems to get it and understand what a fantastic audience we have is a podcaster who knows this industry and knows the podcasting world extremely well. And he appreciates Macro Voices as being unique in terms of the extremely well-qualified audience that we have. Most people, frankly, don't get it. I'm talking to prospective sponsors this week. Uh, I won't mention the name of the organization, but uh, I talked to one person who said, well, tell us about who your guests are on this podcast so we can think about whether we want to sponsor it. And I'm talking to them about David Rosenberg and how we have people like Charlie McEllicott from Numura and how we have some really intelligent people like Chris Cole, who predicted the blow up of the vault complex on our show before it happened. And they interrupted me to say, well, do you ever get any really big names like, say, a Jim Cramer or somebody like that? And I had to bite my tongue and say, you know, well, he's actually not on our wish list, believe it or not. And they said, oh, well, if you don't really have any big names and, and you can't pull them in, I don't think we're interested. So we're finding that most of the people that buy advertising, you know, they don't know what the vault complex is. They don't know that it blew up last year. They don't know what we're doing. So we really need your help, folks, in talking to your organizations. The, the people that ought to be sponsoring Macro Voices are the big brokerages, online brokers, and wealth management, anybody who's got something to sell to a very sophisticated audience. We've got got pro finance and very, very sophisticated private investors listening to this show. And frankly, what we're down to, the option that's available to us is there are these podcast advertising services where you just get screaming announcers that are selling mail order Viagra or whatever it is that they're selling. And, you know, we can we can fill macro voices up with that in order to get some revenue to cover our production expenses. But we'd much rather get interesting companies that have financial services that might actually be of interest to our listeners. We're not finding them and we really need your help. So please talk to your management and see if your company is interested in sponsoring macro voices. When I launched the expanded content in May, I told myself I was going to go ahead and fund it out of my own pocket for a maximum of six months and give it a chance to become self-sustaining. Well, the clock runs out next month. So we've already slowed things down a little bit in the sense of putting our Energy Week podcast on hold. And you'll also notice fewer All-Stars episodes. So as soon as we can get some more sponsorship, we'd love to turn the dial back up and get more content coming your way. I do want to thank everyone who has donated. That has made a huge difference, and it's been what's kept us going. But until we get more sponsors, we're going to have to start to throttle back on the expanded content. So that's enough. And look at the, the bright side. If you get somebody to sponsor us, you get their one-minute message instead of however long it took me to just say all that. Patrick, let's get over this long spiel and move on to our feature interview. Absolutely. So Eric's interview with Eric Peters is coming up as Macro Voices continues right here at MacroVoices.com. And now with this week's special guest, here's hedge fund manager Eric Townsend. Joining me now is One River Asset Management Chief Investment Officer, Eric Peters. Eric is well known for his weekend reading notes, and I've been particularly enjoying reading a couple of them this week that I want to talk about. We have secured permission to share those with our listeners, so you'll find the download links in your research roundup email. If you're not registered yet, just go to our homepage at macrovoices.com. Look for the red button that says looking for the downloads next to Eric's picture on the homepage. 
Eric, it's great to have you back on the show. I want to talk about some of your weekend reading notes because they resonate very much with a number of themes that I've been thinking about. So I want to start with monetary policy and how long the monetary paradigm, if you will, can last. It seems to me like really for the last 10 years, we've been propping up asset markets with what I think is easy money policy, with quantitative easing and very accommodative monetary policy. But a number of people have said, look, there's only so far monetary policy can take you feels to me like we're coming to the end of that path. Are we at the end of the path? And if so, what comes next? Hey, Eric. Thanks, uh, thanks so much for having me back on, uh, on the show. I appreciate it. Uh, it's always fun. You know what? When I think about uh, what you're describing, yeah, I think it's the most important thing going on in, in the markets, certainly in, in the here and now. And, and here and now for us means over the next year or two. There's this transition that, that is, I, I think, clearly taking place and it's a handoff from what I would call this uh, paradigm of monetary dominance to fiscal dominance, meaning really since I began my career, which is 30 years ago, we've seen the same set of policies dominate markets, and those are really monetary policies. And politics have, have kind of carried on, of course, but they've really been in the background from an economic perspective and certainly from a market perspective. And rates have have fallen progressively lower with with each cycle and they finally ground their way down to zero uh here in the US and then negative overseas and the and the US tried to tried to break higher and uh and we managed to raise rates you know a couple hundred basis points off the lows but we're we're on that on the way back down and we now find ourselves in in a spot where you can just you can just listen to the central bankers and they're telling you that they're that they're largely finished so Powell is I think trying to play his last game, which is he's saying if you know if we uh, if we undershoot our inflation target, but then promise that we'll overshoot in the future, that can have a really positive impact potentially. But that's where you know that's where we are in the U.S. We're just we're kind of promising to overcompensate with inflation in the future, and I'd say it's far from clear that that's really stimulative anyway. And then in Europe, Draghi recently has um, has made it explicit that the time for fiscal policy to take charge is uh, is upon us and that had we had a real fiscal response in place to date it would have made the monetary policies that that they've implemented more effective and um it would have prevented them from having some of the damaging effects that they have but draghi is draghi is kind of obviously done right when you look at where rates are in europe there's there's just very very little that they can do it's easy to say, okay, uh, monetary policy is pretty much petered out here, uh, so fiscal policy has to come next. But what are the various options for what shape that could take? What kind of fiscal policy options might be under consideration? And what's the range of possibilities we need to think about? Well, the interesting thing about the handoff from monetary to fiscal is that when you think about, when you think about monetary policy, there really are quite a limited suite of um, of policies that our central bankers can implement. I think we can agree that the U.S. is the most important central bank in the world because it presides over, over the U.S. dollar, essentially, and the largest economy. And so the, the Fed over the years has adopted a suite of policies and, uh, and playbooks that, that over time have grown to be standard everywhere. Even really, quite frankly, including China, and China is a little bit of a unique situation because they're able to close their capital account and play various games that you're that you're kind of able to play when you can do that. But by and large, all the central banks have done pretty much the same thing. Now, at, at times, they move at different speeds, and that has created some volatility. But in this handoff, what's so interesting is when you think about what fiscal policy is, it's a it's a policy that is no longer implemented by central banks. So you have a world where central bankers have have become homogeneous in terms of their policy tools and playbooks because they've followed the Fed. And they're now saying, we need to hand it off to the fiscal authorities. Well, the fiscal authorities are politicians and, and politicians are not really homogeneous. So even here in the US, the fiscal response that we may have to the next crisis could, could look and, and would look very different under a Trump presidency relative to a Warren presidency, for instance. 
in Europe, same thing applies. When you look at what happened to Italy, you know, fiscal policy under under one set of politicians could look very different from under another set. Same with Germany and same same with France. So depending on what politicians we have in place, we have very different fiscal policies. And that's what's going to make the world look awfully different in, in the coming years, because the central banks can't direct fiscal policy. It is only the politicians. And because the politicians are not homogeneous, that's where we're going to get some very different outcomes. Now, in terms of what, what can we do on the fiscal side, there are all kinds of different flavors. I think ultimately, and, and this will go into some of the discussions I'm sure we have about the generational conflict that is looming, but ultimately, I think what, what countries adopt is something that looks an awful like what we're calling MMT. But really, it's, governments are going to spend an awful lot more money because they have limited ability to really stimulate growth at this point. And a lot of the tax policy and kind of just redistributing growth around an economy that's already running very slowly is, is quite difficult to do with taxes. So ultimately, there's going to be a, quite a robust fiscal stimulus that happens through, you know, through borrowed money, of course. You know, one of the things that I've really become convinced of, Eric, is that what politicians have seen in the last 10 years, and, you know, they don't really understand all of the intricacies of monetary policy and so forth, but just looking at it from their vantage point, they've learned uh, that there's a trick they didn't know about. You can conjure trillions of dollars of liquidity essentially out of thin air with quantitative easing and spend it without having to tax anybody in order to do so. They didn't know that was possible, and I think they want in on the deal, and I think that's both sides of the aisle and with very different agendas. Uh, I think the left probably wants to fund universal basic income and you know a long list of other social handout programs, and I think that the right probably has a different spending agenda, but politicians – everywhere just love the idea of spending money and not having to be accountable to any particular individual who got taxed for it, who's not going to vote for them. So would you agree that, that that's going to play a, a big role? And, and how do you think it will affect the coming election year? I think it will play a big role. So I, I agree with your thinking on that, Eric. And look, we can see with, with what happens here in the U.S. with the Republican Party, it wasn't long ago that we were we were talking about the Republican Party as being owned by by the Tea Party and um, and real fiscal conservatives and and then the Republican Party took power and implemented a one and a half trillion dollar tax cut and all kinds of other budget increasing measures. I've done some some advisory work with some of the the Dems as well, and there's there's just clearly no no strong focus on fiscal conservatism. And, and I think that that's, that's natural. And by the way, it's probably healthy in the sense that we've had kind of orthodox economic thinkers warning of, of all kinds of tragedy post the 2008 crisis with this monetary policy response that we, we saw to the Fed. People warned about you know, massive inflation. They've warned about all kinds of catastrophe that would come along with with QE. But probably, probably the biggest catastrophe that's happened, I think, from an overall economic and and social perspective, is just the widening of the of the inequality. So we haven't seen the big inflation. We haven't seen the collapse in the currency. We haven't seen some of the types of chaos that fiscal conservatives warned us about. So naturally politicians are going to say, well, if we haven't seen those problems already, then why don't we just keep doing more of this? But I think the more of this will shift away from this pure monetary response, which is widening out inequality, and it'll shift toward a fiscal response, which actually will work to narrow that inequality. So one of the things that I think as a 52-year-old, I've come to, uh, uh, to see a little bit more clearly over the course of my career is that the establishment and you know when I say the establishment, I'm talking about the political establishment, but also the economic establishment. They really don't want to see significant change. And I think that collectively they've done a good job of warning that any real type of fiscal expansion will threaten our, our prosperity as a nation. And part of the reason for that, I think, is that there's this mistrust of politicians. And if politicians are able to just spend a lot of money, people worry that it'll get wasted. But a big part of it as well is 
the establishment, you know, by definition, they're the ones in power and they don't want to see really significant change either politically or economically. And so any of these programs like the Green New Deal or, um, you know, making college cheap or, or free or providing Medicare for all, these are things that really disrupt, uh, in doing so with borrowed dollars, these are things that really disrupt the status quo. And that's a big part of, of why people th that are, you know, that I would call in the establishment don't, don't want that. And they've convinced us that any of these changes would be catastrophic. But I think what we've seen over the past decade, which is really interesting, is, is some of these policies have not been catastrophic. And if anything, they've just widened inequality. And now we're seeing that that political backlash. And that, that's what will drive the real change. That's what's going to be so interesting here. You've written recently about a redivision of the proverbial pie. And I, I agree with you that this is, is coming. Let's go a little deeper into that. How do you see this, this coming about? What do you think the political and social changes are going to be? And what will the implications be on the economy when it happens? The implications on the economy, I would say, are I think it'll depend on how on how some of these things are are implemented. So if you take it back and look at it from a very high level, I think you could look at a redistribution as being a very positive thing in the sense that historically, when you've seen mass inequality that continues to widen, historically, you've uh, had revolutions. And that's a really, really bad outcome, right? So if we can have some type of sensible redistribution, that falls well shy of a revolution. Let's, I think what we should all agree is, is that's a super positive thing. And I think you've seen a lot of extremely wealthy people in the U.S. Uh, who would agree with that and would much prefer a thoughtful redistribution to something that's more revolutionary. How it actually happens, again, I think it's like everything that we're going to have to start contemplating as we look out over the, the coming years it's hard to predict because it's a function of politics. It's not a function of central banks. Over the past few decades, you could kind of look at almost any issue and just try to think about what will be the monetary response and, and you know, how do I model that? I think the, the redistribution that's coming will be political and it really will depend on, it'll depend on who's, um, who's in power. The market impact though, I think will be unambiguously negative, at least for a period of time as you readjust. Because when you think about you know, what has really driven a whole range of these trends, we've had, we've had stock buybacks, we have very high profit margins, and high profit margins are really the inverse of low wages. So if you think that we're heading toward uh, redistribution, that relationship is going to change, meaning wages go up, which means profit margins go down. We've had a very low tax regime. That seems like it's pretty obviously going to change. If it doesn't in this election cycle, I think it will change even more dramatically in the next one. And then we've seen, you know, big drivers, certainly in the U.S. market has been these technology names, and there's been loose to almost no regulation of, of these companies. And that seems very, you know, very clearly something that, that is going to change as part of this redistribution. You just, you know, I think we've, we've hit a point where there, there are too many people out principally on the West Coast that have made enormous amounts of money and have, in some respects, advanced society, but have also gutted a lot of, uh, a lot of labor through some of the, the different types of products and services that, that, that they've you know, put in place. And so I think there'll, there'll be a lot more regulation. So, you know, these are just some of the things that will start changing in a, in a redistribution, and they seem pretty unambiguously bad for markets relative to what we've experienced. They should lead to higher inflation. And, you know, that that will ultimately savage bond markets. These things will take some time to play out. But um, that, but that's why I see it having such a big impact. Eric, something else I know you've written about that I'd like you to, to touch on is what I see as a generational gap. And it's it's there are issues like climate change where uh, let's try not to take sides for the sake of, of this interview. But you've got a whole bunch of people who are absolutely convinced that there's absolutely no scientific basis for it. And you've got a whole bunch of people who think that the science is just so clear that there's no room for debate. And curiously, if you look at, well, how is it possible that people 
disagree so much. It's generational and political boundaries that the disagreement seems to occur on, even though the science and theory should be independent of those things. What's going on here? Why is it that we, we have what seems to me like a growing generational and political division in the country? And what is it going to mean for the economy? I'm fascinated by this this conflict. And I think that this conflict between generations, and, and I think it's a really important one to focus on from even from a market perspective. So we've recently seen this climate strike that's rippled globally, and it's touched just about every, certainly every developed nation in the world, but a lot of developing nations in the world as well, everyone except China, which uh, shut down any type of protest on the climate. But irrespective of your views on the legitimacy of climate change or the speed at which it's changing. You just look at, in my lifetime, the fish population in in the oceans is down 50%. A lot of commercial species are down 75%. Bird and reptile populations in North America are down 30 to 50%. So there are some really profound changes that are happening around us. And what is fascinating is that young people have latched onto this. And it's not just young people in the US or Sweden or Europe. It really is global. And they're able to communicate and coordinate for the first time in human history at a scale that we've just never seen. And while the older people, meaning, uh, I guess, people like myself and, and you and, and, and others, a lot of people who are, who've been investing for the last few decades you know, we've been so focused on GDP and debt and productivity and interest rates and profit margins and taxes. And you have, you have a large body of younger people that are not prioritizing those things. And maybe over the coming decades, they'll recognize that these are really important. But in the here and now, they're not a major priority. And why that's interesting is because one of the things I hear often is that, is that the world is going to become like Japan. So Japan... Japan society began aging first, and then Europe came after that, and then kind of China and the U.S. hit their peak working age populations after Europe. And so you've seen this this model whereby people say, well, all of this economic stagnation is a function of just aging populations, and consequently, inflation is coming lower, et cetera, et cetera, and that's just not going to change because it's age-related. Well, I would say that one of the interesting dynamics that you that you find in Japan is a very cohesive society. And so after their bubble burst and their population or the working age population peaked, I'd say that as a group, they accepted economic stability for really stagnation. That was the trade-off. And what stagnation means is you just have a less dynamic society for younger people. And what I do not observe are younger people in the US and increasingly in Europe just being, you know, just willing to accept this stagnation in exchange for stability. And I think that that is going to be the pressure that bubbles up from underneath for real for real change, not just in the next recession, but I think we're seeing it right now where there's just greater, there's a greater push to rethink how we're doing all kinds of things, whether it's the climate and increasingly it'll be fiscal policy. And that's where, that's really where MMT comes in because what happens is the older people right now globally, and there are a lot of them, they're worried about things like their medical care, their pensions, et cetera, et cetera. And a lot of these are not in great shape, so they're going to have to get bailed out, and that's going to cost a lot of money. The younger people are worried about the environment. And so you either have a situation where the young people and the old people start fighting over where's the money going to be spent. Is it going to be spent on things that are dynamic and help restructure our corporations and industry to be to be greener? Or is the money going to be spent on Medicare and Medicaid and, and plugging holes in pensions? And the answer historically is in a fiat currency system, both of those parties will be satisfied because the politicians will choose the path that is least painful. And that's going to be to create more money to go after um, the funding of a, a Green New Deal and provide that while also plugging the pensions and providing Medicare, Medicaid, et cetera, et cetera. So I think that's super important. And, that, and that's, that's why it's highly unlikely that the West follows the same path as Japan.
I really strongly agree with you on these points. I think that it's very clear that younger generations simply have different priorities, different values. And hey, you know, they, they are going to become the dominant force in the economy. So clearly, at some point, their priorities, whether old folks agree with them or not, are going to become the dominant force. Is that something that you think happens through a slow grind or are there going to be sudden spikes and events where all of a sudden there's there's kind of a little revolution and it's it's damn it you know there has to be free college or forgiveness of student loans or whatever and it, it happens all quickly oh i think i think it happens it happens in bursts and it happens quickly just look at this climate strike it's stunning look at just go online and google climate strike in any country you want to choose what you'll find is you'll find very similar or identical placards that are handwritten, by the way, they're not mass produced, with similar or identical messages all over the world. And little island nations in the Pacific, you know, in, in India, in Australia, in, throughout Africa, the US, of course, all over the world, you see the same thing. And how does that happen? It happens through this coordination. I mean, I, I think we're, we really underappreciate how these younger people are mobilizing in ways that just that we can't we, we don't have a framework for it so i think some of these changes will happen quickly and and again because we're entering this world of the political politics can change almost overnight monetary policy historically just hasn't it's just moved in this this kind of steady fashion over decades so yeah i think this change will will happen i think it is happening very quickly it is happening very quickly Eric, let's tie these high-level views into an outlook for the markets. Obviously, there's a lot of change, I think, that we both agree is coming socially. How do you relate that to what you see on the horizon in the investable time frame? Why don't we start with equity markets? Equity markets, for starters, they seem like they really don't want to go down right now, just in the here and now. I think they've been enormously resilient in the face of a really awful, awful news flow. And one of the ironies of the negative news flow that we've seen for a long time is that it's provided this almost endless wall of worry that the that the market has, um, has I think, been able to climb. I think the market's reaction function or investors' reaction function in a world where rates are, are this low and there's so many trillions of dollars of negative yielding bonds is just to look for anything that has yield and continue to be willing to accept less and less liquidity in their investments in exchange for just some type of incremental return. One of the big sources of generating some type of uh, incremental return has been through selling volatility. And so I think until, until there's a real change in market direction here, a lot of those behaviors will continue as they have done. And, and that ultimately is just supportive of markets. So it's this, I think that we remain in this environment where Lower vol is getting lower vol because it's reinforcing the investment behaviors and patterns that uh, that support market stability. But the changes that we've talked about today beneath the surface, when markets do finally transition away from this monetary policy dominance toward fiscal dominance, I think once they make that transition, then a lot of the changes that are happening underneath the surface will become uh, quite manifest. And, and the behaviors that have been rewarded will be will be punished you know, quite quite severely. And the biggest, I, I'd say one of the biggest behaviors is this is this fall selling. And, uh, and it's interesting that where, you know, equity markets, at least in the U.S., were up, you know, generally around all-time highs. Implied fall markets, certainly in FX, are down near all-time lows. And so, and, and rates are, uh, are at extraordinarily low levels. So, you know, when, when the transition happens, there's going to be, there's room for a lot of very uh, significant market moves here across asset classes. So I think we'll see some very big trends, but for the time being, you know, money is just is just trying to hide in anything that can provide an incremental return. Do you think bond yields have bottomed? Uh, at, what was it, one forty something on the ten year? Uh, we're now back up to one seventy something as we're speaking. Are we seeing the beginnings of a of a change of trend, or is this just a correction? I don't know. I, I suspect that uh, that we're in a bottoming pattern. I think that the you know the next real economic crisis will will be met with some quite powerful monetary policy, in the sense that they're going to go right back at it and and try to 
buy a lot of bonds and do a lot of QE. I don't think that it will lower rates to levels that most people expect because markets are pretty good at, at looking out six to nine months. And, and I think in the next in the next bout of real economic weakness, the markets are going to see that there's going to be a very powerful fiscal response. So the first response naturally would be monetary it's just because you have guys in power who can implement a new round of QE or something like that. But the markets are smarter than just following those guys all the way down. They'll the markets will sniff out major fiscal, um, a la MMT, whatever you want to call it, a major fiscal response. And that that should prevent rates from going as low as people are probably expecting in this, you know, in this next round. I think if if politicians are, are just utterly impotent, then then rates have a lot further to go. But I, I think what we're seeing is that's that's not really the case. You know, we've got politicians that have big plans for you know big spending and Lord knows with climate change and Medicare and Medicaid to pay for, there, there are plenty of places to uh, borrow a lot of money and spend it. Coming back to equity markets, you know, it's pretty darn clear that global equity markets are selling off here. But as you said, the S&P has been extremely resilient. That could be interpreted either of a couple of ways. You, you could say, okay, that means the S&P is late to the game. You know, it's, it's, it's time to short the S&P now because it's high and about to follow the other guys down. Or you could say, no, wait a minute, this is because of some secular driver in the global economy that's attracting capital to the United States, and the U.S. is going to continue to substantially outperform over the next several years. Which way do you see that going? I think the U.S. has a lot of advantages over the rest of the world in, uh, in kind of the world that, that I see unfolding in, in the sense that, well, our politics may look like they're a real mess. I think we're, we at least have a political construct that can make some decisions around around a real fiscal response to the next bout of, of weakness. Europe is is really handicapped in that respect. I think that their central bankers have really hurt their overall economic structure by lowering rates as uh, as deeply as they have into you know into negative territory. When you look at how they're priced, they're priced at basically zero or lower rates out for you know eight eight ish years. So, you know, Europe, Europe's in a tough spot and until until the Germans really crack, they're not going to do anything significant on the fiscal side. The Chinese have all kinds of problems, not that that's a market that people are extremely active in, but you know, Japan wants to become more austere incredibly even if that even if that hasn't worked out for them over the last couple decades. I think they're, you know, they're ready to to raise the consumption tax. So, you know, the U.S. the U.S. actually, even though we have horrible political headlines in terms of uh, you know what's happening domestically, I think that we continue to be quite a flexible economy. I think that our equity markets will go down, but I don't think it's it's completely irrational to have our markets outperforming some of the other ones. And where do you see precious metals with everything that we've discussed about the the changing? generational trends and so forth. I suppose one argument is that if we're about to have a, a lot of government spending, probably gold's a really good place to be. Uh, if you really want to take the generational argument a little further, you could say, well, no, gold's out, crypto's in. Well, how do you see that? What, what, what do you think precious metals have in store? And if you have a view on crypto, tell us that as well. Precious metals, I think, will go a lot higher. The thing is, they, you know, they, they may, um, they've had a bit of a bit of a move here. And the natural response of people in the next bout of economic weakness is that we're going to get a deflation. And so they may come off, but uh, you know, it's a little bit like bond yields. Gold may come off, bond yields may go down, but, but they're not going to go down. Gold's not going to go down a, a very long way because the, the next response really will be materially inflationary. So I think that's a, a very interesting space. Crypto, that's a longer discussion. You know, that, that's not a place where we are active. Um, I watch it. I think it's extremely interesting. But, but I, 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 just, I don't think that that's a place to put any significant money for the foreseeable future. And finally, Eric, the word on the street is that One River may be gearing up to launch a couple of new funds. What can you tell us about these rumors and what's going on there? <laughs> Thanks. Nice to have rumors floating around like that. Yeah, we currently manage um, uh, some volatility strategies and systematic trend strategies. We're coming out with, with a couple more. 
which I think is very exciting. And uh, we have a relative value vol trading strategy that we have been managing now for for over a year. It's done uh, it's done very well. There are awful lots of flows in the vol space that have that presented us with some really attractive risk reward opportunities. We see that continuing, and uh, it's a very high sharp strategy, which um, which we like. We also are doing some interesting things in the systematic long vol space for clients that are, are looking to hedge some of their negative convexity in their portfolio. And in a, in a world where interest rates are this low, there are very few good diversifiers left. And uh, we've developed a strategy and have run it now for, for clients uh, in managed accounts for about four years. It's performed extremely well. And then in our trend, we have a, we have top decile trend performer for the past five years and, and are launching one focused, uh, a new trend focused on esoteric markets, so alternative markets, things like European power markets and equity sectors. And uh, I think there's some very interesting opportunities in markets that are not so heavily trafficked. And, uh, and so we're applying our algorithms to those markets. And we've got great backing from some wonderful investors across the board for all these these products. So yeah, it's a busy, uh, busy Q4 for us. And of course, these investments are only available to accredited investors. For the very significant accredited audience that we have, how can our accredited investors reach you if they want to get more information about your funds? They can go to our website. It's oneriveram.com. Eric, I can't thank you enough for a fantastic interview. Patrick Ceresna and I will be back as Macro Voices continues right here at macrovoices.com. Macro Voices is a listener-driven program. Please email requests for specific future interview guests to requests at macrovoices.com. You can email questions for the program to mailbag at macrovoices.com, and we'll answer them on the air from time to time in our mailbag segment. We also welcome your suggestions for how we can improve the program. Now, back to your hosts, Eric Townsend and Patrick Ceresna. Eric, what a great interview with Eric Peters. You know, what I, I really appreciated was how genuinely uh, candid he was about all of your questions. He really tackled all of those things. It was very diplomatic and kind of big picture trying to understand. I, I really sat there and enjoyed the whole interview. Uh, what did you take away from it? Well, he's a, as you say, he's a really smart, big picture guy. And I think that he has it exactly right in the sense of, of two things, really. One is what we should be thinking about is how is the world going to change as wealth redistribution becomes a major political agenda? And, you know, the strongest advice I have to listeners is don't let your judgment be clouded by whether you think that's good or bad. I'm sure that most of you have a strong opinion one way or the other. What we think isn't important. It's what the world around us is actually going to do that will affect financial markets. And I think it's going to be very, very interesting, you know, as, as we see the markets starting to sell off here, is the Fed really going to come to the rescue with QE? And when they do, Will it cause a political revolt where they say, no, no more bailing out Wall Street if we're going to do QE? And that's, I, I've been thinking that that's probably what a lot of politicians are waiting for is when the Fed announces QE, I wouldn't be surprised if a lot of politicians already have their statement prepared saying, no, I oppose this because we did this once before. It bailed out Wall Street. It didn't help Main Street. If we're going to conjure money out of thin air using what is effectively an indirect form of a printing press, then we ought to be helping Main Street with it. And they make a very good point. The thing is, if you're pumping money into the real economy, if you're giving it to Main Street in the form of helicopter money, that has completely different dynamics in terms of how it affects markets. It's not like the QE that we have known and some people have loved previously. So it's a totally different situation. We need to be thinking about all of these things. It's really important and very few people are thinking about it. Now, the other thing he said is he doesn't have all the answers and I don't think anyone does. We're in uncharted territory, but it's really important to think about what these different scenarios are and start trying to create frameworks and models for how these things might unfold. And I'm surprised by how few people see the big picture as clearly as Eric Peters does. 
But Patrick, I know what we can see very clearly, which is your chart book once again this week, which listeners, you'll find the download link in your research roundup email. If you're not yet registered, just go to our homepage at macrovoices.com. Look for the red button that says looking for the downloads. Let's uh, dive in here on page two. You've got an S&P 500 daily chart. What's going on here with all of these uh, red support and resistance lines? Well, they're not really support resistance lines. What I actually just wanted to do is actually measure peak to trough moves of the market corrections that have happened over the last one year. So I'm uh, marking the September through December market drop, the May market drop, the subsequent July market drop, and this current one. And uh, what I wanted to just kind of put in context is that while everyone's got uh, a lot of energy about this recent sell-off that ha happened over the last few days, but when we look at it relative to the past three sell-offs that happened over the last year, this is not only what, still one of the shortest by duration, but it's also almost uh, you know, 70 S&P points or so less than even the deepest of the last waves of corrections. The average correction, I think back in May, was about a 230 S&P point drop. The one in July was about 250 S&P points. And this current one is only about 165 S&P points from peak to trough. What I would just want to take away from this is that if this is all that happened and that reversal candle that you were talking about in the market wrap came to fruition, that this would uh, be uh, quite a pathetic stab at the downside on a relative basis. And uh, I, I still am very suspect that this isn't over. I may, maybe this is not the big kahuna. Maybe this isn't going to be uh, that 10, 20% drop. But I still think that, you know, even though we're 50 points off of the intraday low, I'm still suspect that there's another wave of selling. What's your take on that? Well, I think that, and this goes very much back to Eric Peters' interview, I think that the big, big question is probably what happens is there's more turbulence in, over the course of October. There's, you know, seasonally, it's, it's a good month for volatility that sets the Fed up on their Halloween FOMC meeting to either announce QE or a very significant, let's say, at least a 50 basis point interest rate cut, some kind of aggressive accommodation. And I think a lot of people are already pricing that in and expecting it. What almost nobody is thinking about is what if they get cut off at the pass politically? We're into clearly into election season by then, less than, than a year or, or just a year and a few days before the presidential election of 2020. And what if there is a lobby of politicians ready to jump in and say, hell no, we're not going to allow the Fed to bail out Wall Street again with more QE. If we're going to have QE, it has to be helicopter money. It has to support universal basic income and other agendas other than the kind of QE that the Fed is thinking about. And, you know, the Fed's very vulnerable right now. They, they're under a lot of pressure from the president, which is, I think, perhaps misplaced in some ways. But the Fed's feeling pretty vulnerable. And if they're getting it from the other side of the aisle, too, saying if you're going to do any kind of accommodation, it needs to be for Main Street, not for Wall Street. Don't go that direction. I think it could suddenly become very, very politically contentious. And that could really really panic markets to the downside when it looks like the Fed wants to come charging into the rescue, but might not be allowed to do so because of political pressure. Now, that, that's an outlier. It's not a, a base case. But if it were to happen, I think it could cause incredible fireworks. Do you think that that's something that could be immediate, like in terms of the next few days, something that you – because like to me, I'm looking at this more like a technical perspective of what is uh, in store here for the next one week or two weeks of price action. And the one thing I want to leave all of our listeners with is, is that just using the analog of, of the May market correction, which was 33 days and 230 S&P points from peak to trough – and during that just over a month sell-off, there was at least – 
five times that the S&P 500 rallied 50 S&P points on an intraday basis and once that it did almost 100 and each time rolled over and sold off. And so at least at the time we're recording this, we're, you know, 50 S&P points off of the low. I'm, I'm not ready to already call this a bottom. I think that uh, there's a lot of times the market demonstrates these fake outs. I'm still suspect that this may have a little more selling to go. Anyway, um, well, hang on. I, I think we're in violent agreement here because what I see in this chart is I see a bounce. It doesn't mean it's over, but I see the beginnings of a bounce. We, we had a couple of days, really, really hard down days. Now we're seeing this hammer this morning. It's a bounce. It might last into next week. Maybe it rolls over next week and, you know, we're, we're back down to 2800 by the end of next week. And, and maybe we're down to 2750 by the end of the month. I think it's at that point when everybody's expecting the Fed to rescue the market and we find out either they do or they don't or they do, but then there's suddenly a political reaction to it that makes everything get complicated. Yeah, well, I, my call right now is I still think that there's, the market is quite vulnerable for another round of selling still. Maybe we head back down to those lows that were established back in June and August and kind of retest those lows. Maybe we're not seeing the big kind of September to December sell-off we had last year. But I think the selling still continues a little bit more. Maybe we bounce toward the end of the year after uh, the earnings season, but uh, I still think we go a little bit lower before we go higher higher. On page three, I just wanted to actually show the charts on those ISM numbers. I have both the uh, manufacturing PMI and the non-manufacturing PMIs. Eric, when we look at the US ISM, we had the manufacturing PMIs come out earlier this week, printed a 47 spot eight, which was the, the worst number we had, I think, since 2009, at least on this chart that goes to 2012, it was the lowest print, which is really showing in line with what is a global manufacturing recession is now starting to really spill over into the U.S. And I think what shocked everyone this morning was when the non-manufacturing PMI, which was is a much larger part of the U.S. economy, came in much lower than expected. I think everyone had a forecast somewhere around 55 and it came around 52 two spot six. And so this deteriorating economic numbers is what really is now driving, I think at least the response higher in the market was this idea now that the Fed is uh, more than likely to keep cutting. And I, uh, I think and that's the key, Patrick, because if you look at this crazy reaction we saw in the market, is how many points did, did we hammer down and then suddenly retrace all of it within a matter of 20 minutes? Well, how do you explain that happening? What happens is Oh, my God, 52 spot six on the non-manufacturing ISM. Sell, 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 sell. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. This has to mean the Fed's going to do something. We know they're going to be accommodative. Buy, 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 buy. And that's the reason that you saw this. Everybody's expecting the Fed to rescue the day. If they didn't have that, the selling would have kept going and we'd be at least 100 points lower now. Everybody's assuming the Fed's going to rescue the market. And maybe they are. Maybe they're going to announce QE4 exactly as Juliet de Klerk has predicted. Maybe there won't be any political interference with that. And maybe that takes us up to 3,500 in the S&P. I don't know. But there's a lot that could go wrong with that story, and I think the market is kind of complacent thinking that it has to play out to where the Fed somehow saves the day. That's not the only possibility here. Right. And so, you know, what I shared on page four is the uh, euro dollar spread between December 2019 to December 2020, which is implied rate cut, now pricing in 57 basis points. And that's now back very close back to the September lows. And we're not at the lowest point yet. But what we clearly can see is that they're starting now to price that in. And what's interesting about that is, is that this has actually led to a steepening of the curve. So on page five, I have the twos tens curve. And we, while we were inverted, 
we now definitively have a spike higher. We now we have not beat the 2019 high range, which is in that kind of 20 to 25 basis point spread, which is still a, a hurdle that has to be beat. But what's fascinating here is, is that as the market now sniffs out the fact that the Fed is going to have to cut, the question then is, is that are we going to see that bull steepening as uh, they take that short end of the curve and start uh, pressing it substantially lower, anticipating that the Fed may even have to go as low as zero moving forward. And Patrick, I want to encourage our listeners to consider going back and listening to our January 15th, 2019 episode with Charlie McElligot. The title of that was Fear the Steepener. Now, Charlie was a bit early on the timing because he thought it was maybe going to start then, and it's only started really since the end of August. But that interview with Charlie McElligot was all about the reasons why Charlie says, look, everybody's used to thinking about yield curve inversion is the big signal that you watch for that to signals an oncoming recession. It's actually when that inversion bottoms out and reverses direction and turns into a steepening, that's when you really want to get scared, according to Charlie. So listen to that interview. Just go to your macrovoices.com in the search box at the top of the page. Type in Fear the Steepener, and it's uh, January 15th, 2019, feature interview with Charlie McElligot. Absolutely. And so chart six, I think, tells us exactly what's happening, because when we were talking about the 10-year yield earlier when we were doing the uh, in the pregame show, we were uh, talking about the yield heading back toward uh, one spot five zero, but it hadn't made new lows yet. But yet when we look at this two-year yield on uh, U.S. government bonds, we are making fresh new lows on yields on the two-year, which, uh, which is exactly that steepening with the, uh, the bull steepener kicking in where the acceleration really is at the two-year yield, two-year bonds ripping, two-year yields dropping at a, a faster pace. And then what I'm going to be very curious about in the coming weeks and months is as to whether this trend continues and whether we actually are going to see genuine steepening of this curve or whether this is just a blip. Patrick, before we close for this week, I want to touch on gold because that 1490 support level that had been so resilient, when it broke a week ago, I thought, okay, now finally the, the move to the downside is on in gold. You would expect that if you take out a critical support level like that, it should turn into resistance in the other direction when you get a rally. We sliced right through it. So we're seeing just really remarkable strength and resilience in gold, despite the fact that the COT reports are telling us we're overdue for a really big pullback. So what do you see in the gold chart? Well, you know, I appreciate what you uh, point out with the commitment of trader reports because I do uh, respect them and I think that it's a very important observation to make. What I personally have learned is that you don't want to overuse it for short-term market timing. I mean, we could stay in that state on the commitment of trader reports for another month or two and the trend may uh, make another significant leg before a meaningful turn. So while I do agree with you that it is very overbought and the sentiment has shifted. I don't necessarily want to immediately conclude, therefore, that the tops in gold are in. I know a lot of people have started to hint that maybe that's a head and shoulders topping formation that they're seeing on gold. But uh, I'm, uh, I'm a little more bullish. I actually suspect that, uh, that there may still be one more leg higher. Now, at the same time, I'm going to want to lock that in with some hedges if it does. But one of the key levels that I think that is very important to watch is somewhere around this very level we're trading, around 1510 to 1520. I mean, if, we, if the bulls can muster up a rally back to, let's say, 1540 plus on the upside, it really does set in motion a resumption in a trend that's been established since the summer. And if, if we saw that maybe there's another move to 16 to 1700 on the upside, I'm, I'm not yet 100% set on it, but I'm watching to see whether or not they can follow through on that. At some point, you're right, there is going to be a correction that's going to wash out all the weak hands that are chasing this. But uh, my intuition is still that there's maybe one more leg higher before that happens. Well, one place I have to agree with you there is as much as I think that we're way overdue already for that correction, uh, I have to admit the 
price action and the tape action has just been more resilient and stronger than I've expected. At every turn, when I think finally the, the big pullback has started, some fairly small news event will spark gold to move much higher. And these these rallies are sharp to the upside and the moves down have been measured and, and kind of reserved. So maybe you're right. Maybe there is another leg up coming before a correction. I, I'm still convinced that we get a correction at some point, and, and I think that's the, the time to really start buying. Obviously, you want to have some gold. I've owned gold for many years. I, I've got a base position. As far as really speculating on a levered position in gold, I, I'm going to hold out for a better buying opportunity. We'll see. I, I missed the last one, so maybe I'll be wrong again. In any event, Patrick, I want to touch before we leave the subject of silver and gold on the Silver and Gold Summit, where you will be speaking on October 27th and 28th at the Hyatt in San Francisco. Tell us a little bit about that event and what you'll be talking about. Absolutely. So the Cambridge House hosts the uh, Silver and Gold Summit every year out in San Francisco. And uh, it's a great show. I had an opportunity to speak there last year uh, and got a great opportunity to meet so many Macro Voice listeners out there. And so I'm really looking forward to heading back out there. It's uh, again, like you were saying, October 27th, 28th. I'll be speaking there with a whole host of names that uh, many of our listeners are quite familiar with. But uh, uh, what's uh, uh, really uh, gracious is that uh, Cambridge House is offering our Macro Voice listeners 50% off of the ticket. And so all you need to use is that promo code MACRO50. That's uh, MACRO50. If you uh, register for the event using that Macro Voice's promo code, you get 50% off the ticket. So make sure you take advantage of that. And I look forward to meeting so many of our Macro Voice listeners again out there. And as we close, Patrick, I also want to touch on that video that you have available. It's called Using Options for Trading Commodity Stock Cycles, very relevant to the discussion of gold and silver. That is for paid subscribers at bigpicturetrading.com only. But you can work around that by getting yourself a 14-day free complimentary pass, which doesn't even require credit card for registration. That's at bigpicturetrading.com. We're going to wrap it there, folks. If you haven't already, be sure to sign up for your free account at macrovoices.com. The benefit to you is you'll receive our research roundup email, which contains links to all of the best content that we could find on the internet, including downloads for the chart books associated with our feature interviews. Patrick, tell them what they can expect to find in this week's research roundup. Well, this week, you're going to find the transcript for today's interview, as well as a link to the last few weekly update letters Eric Peters has shared with us, as well as the charts we discussed here in the post game. There's also an article featuring the highlights of a great interview with Louis Vincent Gav discussing the bond bubble and a Bloomberg article about a chaos scientist finds hidden financial risks that regulators miss. So you'll find this and so much more in this week's research roundup. That does it for this week's episode. We Appreciate all the feedback and support we get from our listeners and are always looking for suggestions on how we can make the program even better. Now, for those of our listeners that write or blog about the markets and would like to share that content with our listeners, send us an email at researchroundup at macrovoices.com or tag it with the MVRR hashtag on Twitter and we will include it in our weekly distributions. If you have not already, follow our main Twitter account at Macro Voices for all the most recent updates and releases. You can also follow Eric on Twitter, at Eric S. Townsend, and myself, at Patrick Serezna. On behalf of Eric Townsend and myself, thank you for listening, and we'll see you all next week. That concludes this edition of Macro Voices. Be sure to tune in each week to hear feature interviews with the brightest minds in finance and macroeconomics. Macro Voices is made possible by sponsorship from BigPictureTrading.com, the Internet's premier source of online education for traders. Please visit BigPictureTrading.com for more information. Please register your free account at MacroVoices.com. Once registered, you'll receive our free weekly research roundup email containing links to supporting documents from our featured guests and the very best free financial content our volunteer research team could find on the Internet each week. You'll also gain access to our free listener discussion forums and research library. 
and the more registered users we have, the more we'll be able to recruit high-profile feature interview guests for future programs. So please register your free account today at macrovoices.com if you haven't already. You can subscribe to Macro Voices on iTunes to have Macro Voices automatically delivered to your mobile device each week free of charge. You can email questions for the program to mailbag at macrovoices.com and we'll answer your questions on the air from time to time in our mailbag segment. Macro Voices is presented for informational and entertainment purposes only. The information presented on Macro Voices should not be construed as investment advice. Always consult a licensed investment professional before making investment decisions. The views and opinions expressed on Macro Voices are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect those of the show's hosts or sponsors. Macro Voices, its producers, sponsors, and hosts, Eric Townsend and Patrick Ceresna, shall not be liable for losses resulting from investment decisions based on information or viewpoints presented on Macro Voices. Macro Voices is made possible by sponsorship from BigPictureTrading.com and by funding from Fourth Turning Capital Management, LLC. For more information, visit MacroVoices.com.